Let's do root mean square, kinetic energy, and gram. They kind of all go together because they're within the kinetic molecular theory of gases. So we're going to do all those together. Let me note a few things down first. So we'll give you this. Root mean square velocity is the square root of 3 RT over M. We'll give you the kinetic energy is 1 half MU squared or 3 halves RT. And then Graham's law will, I forgot exactly how I wrote it, but I think I wrote it on the test rate A over rate B equals the square root of the inverse of the molar masses. You can double check though, if you're in my class, anytime you're curious what's given on the exam, you just go to the practice exams, and it has a given info here for this quarter on page five. Exam two givens. Oh, I put for a fusion rate. There's Graham's law right there. Uh, let's see what of action. Here's the energy formulas from before. Here's that Rydberg. Here's a lot of equations you'll never use. Uh, here's the root mean square velocity, and there's the kinetic energy right there. All right, so those are all given. You just need to know how to use them. Let's focus in on what was asked about. Uh, first of all, the root mean square velocity. Uh, I think the person was asking was not asking about this formula in particular, but what mathematically does root mean square velocity mean? Is that right, person? Humanoid? Yes, so if I gave you a bunch of velocities, how would you find it? Okay, so this is not actually using this formula. It's just wondering what the heck is the root mean square. So for example, if I gave you a couple velocities, let's say at 3 meters per second, 4 meters per second, 7 meters per second, and another 4 meters per second. So let's say there's four molecules or four entities, and they're going this fast. Let's actually mathematically, not using this formula, but just calculate what a root mean square means. Uh, to do that, let's go through all the velocities just to make sure you got it. So for example, the one you're probably familiar with is the average velocity. Uh, I'm writing it U with a bar on top. That means you just go 3 plus 4 plus 7 plus 4 divided by a total of 4 digits. Okay, that's just an average. Okay, so this is, uh, I don't know how the other instructors, what variable they're using. I use that. Okay, another statistical quantity we use is called the mode. That's just the most popular velocity. So 4 is the most popular, so it's just 4. There's no math. You just look at what's the most common velocity. Okay, now before we get to the root mean square velocity, um, let me show you what this is. Okay, this would mean the average of the squares. So let me show you what that means. Uh, this would be if I went 3 squared plus 4 squared plus 7 squared plus 4 squared divided by the total number of quantities, 4. So there's 4 velocities, that's why that 4 goes down there. So it's like the average, but it's the average of the squares. So that's called a mean square. Now let me get another color. If I take the square root of that, so I'll do it in black, square root of that, this is the root mean square. So it's the square root of the uh, average of the squares. So root mean, mean average, square. Uh, this, is this equal to the average? Yes or no? No, unless it's just a random scenario. The root mean square and the average velocity are not the same value. All right, so those two numbers are not the same. So if you're given a couple of velocities and you had to actually calculate it, that's how you do it, the one on the bottom. Or if you ask for the average, it's just this, the mode is just the most common. Okay, that was one of the questions. The other one was, uh, what was the question again about the kinetic energy? A 
how the kinetic energy varies? Yeah. That's right. How does that work? Okay, I think I know what you're talking about. Uh, the question, this is kind of getting to the ideal versus real, so we're going to get that too. Bonus topic. Okay, thanks for adding the topic to us. This is good. Uh, I want to note a few things. Uh, first, before I answer your question, information that's good to know. I would, for those of you who have, uh, can look back at my notes and or have the reader, the two things you want to be familiar with first, and I'm going to refer to this to answer your question. You need to know, this is on page 50 of the reader, these five assumptions. The second thing to know, it's not related to your question, is these, the concepts that go with these governing equations. But to answer your question, it really goes with these five equations. Uh, now, this next part that I'm going to say is also not getting to your question, but you just want to contrast these equations for an ideal gas, and we'll do this in a minute, with these concepts written on page 54 for real gas. So I'll do that in a moment. Uh, but those are good to know. Compare and contrast what's a real and what's an ideal gas. First, to answer your question. Uh, one of the assumptions here, fifth assumption, the average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature. So let me write that down. In my class, I write kinetic energy like this. It's proportional to the temperature. Okay. At the same temperature, all molecules are going to have the same average kinetic energy. Okay, those, how I worded it was pretty important. So they, let's take air right now. In air, there's nitrogen, there's oxygen, there's other gases like argon. All those elements or compounds have the same average kinetic energy because they're at the same temperature. That's what that assumption means. So at the, at the same temperature, they have the same average. Now, they don't have the exact same kinetic energy. So we couldn't say that all molecules in air have the exact same kinetic energy. That's a totally different statement. On average, they're the same. All right. Now, there's something else that's related to this that was inherent in your question, which was uh, the kinetic energy is equal to 1 half mu squared. Okay. So we talked about in class Smaller masses means a higher velocity if the kinetic energy is the same, say, at a given temperature. So, uh, for example, uh, there's nitrogen in air. Nitrogen N2 would have 14 times 2 or 28 molar mass, versus oxygen would be 16 times 2 or 32. Okay, which one goes slower, oxygen or nitrogen in air? Oxygen, so the heavier one, O2, should move slower, but because they're at the same kinetic energy, that change of both of them is keeping the kinetic energy constant. So that's the key concept. The difference in sizes only affects the velocity, not the temperature or the kinetic energy. Okay, so get that. That's an important concept to get straight, and you'll most likely see a concept like that in the multiple choice. In fact, most of these, the kind of assumptions, all of these on page 50, compared to the real gases. If, if it's conceptual, you're probably seeing it in the multiple choice somewhere. Okay, now let's compare and contrast ideal versus real gases. Oh, wait. Uh, yeah, let's do that first and then I'll do Graham's Law. Okay, ideal versus real gases. This is mostly just discussion. So the ideal gases, you want to know these five assumptions. They're tiny. They don't take up volume. They move in straight lines randomly in random directions. So they diffuse or effuse, depending on their situation. Uh, there's uh, no attraction or no forces between the gas molecules. Um, uh, elastic collisions. And then the kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. Okay, that's vastly different when we get to the real gases. So a couple that I highlighted for real gases. 
A uh, real gas finds itself in this scenario at high pressure and low temperature. So if you're using the ideal gas law, like in the back of the book, to solve a problem, most of the time, whether you realize it or not, you're at low pressure and high temperature for ideal gases. We just set up the problem like that, because we know ideal gases work in those scenarios. Now, the reverse for a real gas, the higher the pressure and the lower the temperature, that forces molecular interactions to occur. For example, high pressure, you're pushing the molecules close to each other so they can interact or have attraction. That breaks down the ideal gas law assumptions. Or low temperature, that means they move slower. Because they have a, slower, a lower kinetic energy, they move slower so they have more time to interact with each other. That's the sort of thing that breaks down. Uh, or the moles of the gas, um, uh, no, what was I going to say? The molecules take up volume. That's another thing that breaks down. So we wrote uh, in this section, not the ideal gas law, but the Van der Waals equation of state, which is one equation for real gas. It looked like this. You may or may not use it on an exam. So what you want to notice is here, this, the way Van der Waals made that, Van der Waals accounted for a pressure correction. So, say for high pressure and that messes up the attraction between molecules, that's what he accounts for here. And a volume correction, meaning that the molecules don't take up any volume. Or uh, uh, tackling that assumption, I mean. Now, notice these two variables, A here and B here. A and B are constants for a given gas. We would have to give you those numbers if we expected you to use this formula. For a real gas, A and B would be zero or close, no, sorry. For an ideal gas, A and B would be zero or close to zero for ideal gas. So notice what would happen. If A is zero, this would drop out. If B was zero, this would drop out, and you're just left with the ideal gas law. So again, for ideal gases, A and B, those two constants are zero. The more real the gas gets, the higher the value of A and B. And thus you have to use this equation from that point on. Okay. That would be, if, if we was actually using this equation, that would have to be a long answer sort of question. Where you calculate out, say, the temperature. Again, A and B would need to be given if that was the scenario. Uh, now, Graham's Law. Let me say a little bit about Graham's Law. Traditionally, Graham's Law is written like this. Rate, and technically for a fusion, the we in chem 2A will also say it's equal to diffusion as well. Rate of, say, gas A over rate of gas B equals the square root of the molar mass of B divided by the molar mass of A. Um, yeah. And so, uh, here, you know you're going to use Graham's Law if you have two gases, A and B in this case. So if you see two gases in the question, and it's not asking you about partial pressures. Partial pressures means that we're talking about Dalton's Law. But if it's not talking about partial pressures, it's probably one of these. Now, rate, uh, the thing that doesn't change in all the variations of Dalton's Law, no, sorry, Graham's Law, is this right there. That's not going to change. So this could be equal to the ratio of the rates. This could also be equal to, so that could also be equal to, the ratio of the distance that A travels and B travels. So distance is another variable. This could also be equal to, again, instead of rate, instead of distance, uh, let's see, the time that B travels over the time that A travels. That could also, again, the center quantity doesn't change could also be equal to, uh, what was the other one? Amount of A over the amount of B, say, diffusing over a particular distance, okay? Sometimes also, so there's four variations. They're all equal to that square root of MB over MA. Remember, M here is not molarity, it's molar mass for gases. Uh, sometimes in these questions, there's a random variable that's totally not needed for the calculation but it's needed to make it an integrous question. For example, let's say the blue part of the equation right here. 
Uh, let's say I said in a question you have gases A and B, and then I want to know the rate of A uh, for a gas traveling a certain distance, given that the rate of B is equal to a certain number. And that, the way I just worded it, I told you a distance. Distance is not needed to use the blue part of the formula there, but it's needed to say the rates of A and B are standardized over a particular distance of measurement. So sometimes there's an additional variable or number given in a Graham's Law question that is not necessary. That number would be the same for both quantities. It could be a distance or a time or something like that. So just be wary of that uh, issue that arises sometimes. Uh, I made this, I'm still kind of working on it, but um, would it be helpful, do people get confused about which equation, which gas equation to use in which scenario? Okay, so I'm kind of, this is a work in process table. I'm just kind of kicking it around. Okay. I'm not sure if I'm totally done with it yet, but I listed a bunch of equations here, <coughs> since we're talking about equations. Let me explain what I mean. So we've got the ideal gas law. We've got Dalton's law. We've got equations for kinetic energy. We've got Graham's law. We've got the root mean square velocity. And then this word looks a little ugly. It's the combined gas law. That would mean like Boyle's, Charles, all those. Okay. So I made three columns. Is there a mixture? That's the first column after the equations. Is there a change? And then random notes. Okay. So let me explain how this works. Uh, let's, let's look at the ideal gas law. You're going to use the ideal gas law when there's not a mixture and when uh, variables are not changing. So no temperature change, no volume change, no pressure change. Okay? So no mixture, no change. Just one compound, no changes. Little note though, sometimes you use it in a Dalton's law calculation. Okay, so side note there. Dalton's, when do you use that? When you have a mixture, okay, so see how it's different than up here. You use this for a mixture, but we're not seeing changes, like temperature is not changing, volume is not changing, etc. No, no. Kinetic energy, when do you use that? Not for a mixture and not when things are changing. So it's kind of like the ideal gas law, except you see the words kinetic energy in the question. Okay? So that's how you would distinguish these two. Graham's law, kind of interesting. Uh, you use this when there's a mixture, but there's no partial pressures involved. So there's two gases, but it doesn't say anything about partial pressures, where Dalton's law would have partial pressures. Is there a change, and this is why I didn't know totally where to put this check mark here. There's not a change per se, but you will see two different rates asked about. A rate for gas A and a rate for gas B. Now the rate for gas A is not changing, but there are two different uh, variables for rates. Or two different times, or two different amounts. So you'll see two different variables there. The root mean square velocity, not used for a mixture, and it's not used for variables changing. Okay, so no temperature change, no pressure change, no volume change, etc. Now, this is different than kinetic energy merely because you see a velocity asked about here, and you see a kinetic energy asked about here, and this would be a pressure, volume, moles, or temperature. Then the combined gas law, that's like Boyle's, Charles, Avogadro, etc. Not for a mixture, but here's when you see variables changing. So here's when you have a pressure change, a volume change, etc. Uh, I have a couple side notes here. Uh, you could see a kinetic energy or a root mean square velocity question when you have two molecules, but the question will focus on one of the two molecules for the, uh, if it's one of those. So for example, you got molecule A and B, but ask for the root mean square velocity of A only. Okay, so there's two molecules, but you're focused on one. So one molecule of interest. Often, these two are combined together in one question. 
So you've asked the kinetic energy, and then you'll be asked for the root mean square velocity. Okay. All right, that's my working how to tell the difference between different uh, equations in the gas law chapter. All right, moving this. Hopefully you take a, took a picture of it or something. Or write fast. Okay, next. Let's tackle Dalton. We've got two Dalton things going on here. Okay, first Dalton generic, and then we'll do Dalton's over water. All right, generically first. Uh, Dalton, uh, a classic sort of question. It's not always like, it's worded differently, but let me set up the classic sort of question. Let's say we've got A here, B here, and let's say these containers are separated, so I'm putting a valve in the middle. Okay, so a classic sort of question would be you have A and B, they're two separate containers, and then somehow you mix them together. Okay, so you mix them together, and then you ask about the partial pressure or the total pressure or something like that. So a classic question would be, what's the partial pressure of A? Or what's the partial pressure of B? Or, oops, question mark. What's the total pressure? All those would be pretty classic sort of questions. So you're seeing partial pressure of something. Uh, so how do you set this up? Well, they're going to give you info about this one and info about this one. There's two ways we can give you information. So either the classic ways are we're going to give you the mass or we're going to give you the pressure the volume, and the temperature. <coughs> One of those two. Either way, you're going to convert to moles. So you're going to go from, either way, you want to convert this to moles. And you're going to convert this to moles, whatever they give you. In class, I did two different examples. If you're in my class, the scuba diving example, I gave you pressure, volume, and temperature, and you used the ideal gas law to get to moles. In uh, the saving the baby formula with the anesthesiologist, I used, I gave you the mass of A and B and used the molar mass to go to moles. Either way, you need to get the moles somehow. Once you have the moles, I'll say you have moles of A and then you have moles of B, so you need to find those two. You're going to say the total moles is equal to moles of A plus the moles of B. From there, you can find the total pressure. So P total is just going to be the ideal gas law. N total, RT over V. And this would also be a total. So you have N total from right here. R is a constant. T will have to be given. And V total, either they'll give you the final volume of the final container or they're saying you're sticking two containers together and so you have to add these two container volumes to get the total. One of, one of those two scenarios is basically the way these uh, questions will go. So if you're asked for the total, you'd have it right there. The partial pressure, that's when you find, finally get to Dalton's law. So say you're given the partial pressure of A. It's the mole fraction of A times the total pressure or the moles of A over the moles of A plus the moles of B uh, times P total. So, P total is just from right above. You just found it. And then the moles of A over the total, you found it up at the very beginning of the question. Again, this is a really classic, pretty normal way to set up this kind of problem. That's one style, that's your classic Dalton's Law. A variant on this is when it says collected over and then blank something, and that something is usually water. It can be another liquid, it doesn't have to be water. This typically has two steps most of the time, and those two steps usually go in this order, but they could go in reverse order. So this order, I'm going to go one, two, but the one, in, the one 
is not priority over two per se. It depends what's given and what's asked for. Usually you're gonna go like this. P total is P water, I'll just go H2O, plus the partial pressure of the gas of interest. So the question will say something like, we collected this sort of, this gas, whatever that gas is, and we collected it over water, okay? So typically what's gonna happen is, this is what you're curious about. This, does anybody know where we find this number? This is gonna be from a table. Let me show you what that table will look like. It's gonna be in a table that's called vapor pressures. It looks like this, okay? So they'll tell you the temperature, let's say they said 15 degrees, then the partial pressure water is 12.79, that's it, okay? Sometimes, there's a couple variations on how we use this table. One is this classic problem I'm going through right now. But for fun, to see if you can read a table to give you what is theoretically a very easy question. I'll say something like, uh, you have this scenario where you have water at a certain temperature in a certain size container, that's an irrelevant number, at whatever, I'll give you the couple numbers. And all I want you to do is look at the temperature and read the partial pressure off this table. Okay, you'll see that happen sometimes in questions. So sometimes I'll ask, I'll just be asking you to read this table and tell me the partial pressure of water, which is also called the vapor pressure of water. So vapor pressure of water, partial pressure of water, same thing. That's from the table. And this is uh, atmospheric. So for example, the table that I'm giving you is in millimeters of mercury. So atmospheric pressure would be 760 millimeters of mercury. If, oh, oh, whoa, that's funny. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, so, or we give you the total pressure. So if it's not 760, we'll literally give you the number of the question. From subtraction, you can find the partial pressure of the gas. Step two, usually is to find the moles of the gas and you use the ideal gas law to find that. So this is the partial pressure of the gas. The volume is given, the temperature is given, and R is a constant. So all you're gonna do is take the partial pressure of the gas that you found here and plug it in right there. And so you have PV, R, and T, and you'll find the moles of the gas. And sometimes they want you to convert this to a different unit, say convert, for example, to mass. So you just use the molar mass to get the mass of the gas. Okay? Uh, that would be a pretty classic way of doing this, and there's only two equations when it's collected over water, that one and this one. Yes? Uh, uh, no, that ATM is standing for atmosphere. I didn't mean to intend a, a unit. Uh, but if you're using the ideal gas law, if that's what you mean, then yes, you'd have to convert to ATMs from whatever unit uh, to make it fit with R, the ideal gas law constant that we give you on the test. Yeah. So the volume is total in this case? Uh, yeah, the volume is the total in this case. That's right. Which uh, we'll, we'll give you in the question. It'll say such a volume. It's a measured quantity in this experiment. You're going to do an experiment like this at the end of the quarter. It's called the Avogadro, Avogadro's number experiment in a few weeks. And you'll do this exact calculation. Okay. Uh, that was that one, one left. Uh, I think I can finish titrations. Let's do that. Check. Titrations, uh, that would be something like this. Uh, let's say we've got KOH and I'm adding uh, HCl. And if we write the reaction, this would be a neutralization reaction. You get KCl plus H2O. For a titration problem, usually you're given, for example, the molarity 
of this, and maybe you're given the volume, and say you want to know the uh, um, I don't know, the moles of this, or something like that. So you're only focused on the reactants, and it'd be a stoichiometry sort of problem. So you convert to moles of KOH, you go to moles of HCl, and then if that's the unit you want, then you're good. If you need to convert to another unit, just convert to whatever you're asked for. Uh, otherwise, this is just pure stoichiometry. So nothing new here. Uh, you'll just recognize it because you'll see that usually the word titration or standardization or sometimes the word neutralization. One of those three words will hint you to this sort of problem. The other hint is you have a reaction and we'll be, you'll be dealing only with reactants. So pretty classic stoichiometry problem there.